do you know who has access to what? This is the Identity at the Center podcast. If you're looking for identity and access management talk, you've come to the right place. And now, on to the show. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff. That's Jim. I'm Jim. You are Jim. Sitting here in sweltering hot Georgia. Jeff, it is September 13th. It's 95 degrees outside. Um, it's it's not great. You sit in air conditioning all day and go outside, and it's like, when is fall going to be here? <laughs> and you and I are going to be in Boston next week, and I was informed it's going to be in the 90s in Boston uh, in late September. I just don't get it. I don't like it. I don't. I, I find this completely unacceptable, and I'm very excited. You know me, right? Tech, tech kind of nerd guy, right? Sony has a personal air conditioner T-shirt that they're coming out with, and I cannot wait for something like that to become more mainstream. It's going to start in Japan, I think it is later this year. It's like a Kickstarter or yeah. Indiegogo, but I'm hopeful that stuff like that. I'm all about the personal climate control. <laughs> Absolutely, you and your uh, personal fan. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I I've got an observation to share with you, Jeff, which is that I believe you have a resistance to heat and humidity. You're resistant. I am resistant to it. I do not like it. It is not my thing. I am a cold weather bird. I would much rather it be thirty degrees than eighty degrees. Believe it or not. You know, I um, I was. Uh, kind of leading into our conversation today, I was looking at a, uh, a really good blog with the reasons people resist change. And I'm thinking one of the reasons that you're resistant to hot weather is that you were not being consulted. You were not consulted on on whether or not <laughs> hot weather was any good. Yeah, that's that's totally right. And no one no one ran this by me. I would have vetoed it. I would have uh, I would have provided some input into hopefully influencing the decision to be made that that temperature was unacceptable and would need to be revised hour. But that is, that is right there, Jim, that is professional podcast segue magic that you just did. Uh, hey, that's my specialty. Have you that's, done this before? Uh, um, yeah, I think we're on episode 12. So yeah, number 12. Yeah. It's so we're going to really want to talk about change, huh? And battling resistance against kind of change against the I am world, I guess, uh, can come in many forms, many reasons. Right. Things like no funding. I don't know why I need it. You know, what is this thing we're trying to do? Or maybe you've already got something in place and it's just not getting used. Things like that. Yeah, it's been coming up in a couple of our projects recently, which is, you know, customers or clients who have um, deployed IAM tools, reached a certain level of success, and then they're having trouble moving forward. And so you know, the two major examples that I'm probably going to keep referencing back to is first in the privilege access management space where, you know, organizations stand up a great privilege access management tool and the people who need to use it are tremendously resistant and they're finding every reason that it's not going to work. Um, the second area is in, you know, if, whether it's identity governance or kind of uh, single sign on or, you know, access management in general, um, you've got kind of the big guerrilla applications in the organizations or big large groups that are saying, don't touch my application. And I've run into both of these types of situations a few times in my career. And so I'd like to, you know, as the podcast progresses, kind of talk about things I've done that I think can really help uh, our listeners kind of take on those types of resistance. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely some creative ways to solve that. And I, some stuff that, you know, I've done in the past is, is program management. Um, maybe we should start with why is there resistance? And the way that I was thinking about it was I kind of bucketed things into kind of three major categories. There's financial, there's personal, and then there's strategic. So from a financial standpoint, you know, why, why would someone resist doing something in the IM space? And this probably isn't specific either to IM, right? Probably apply to anything, but we're an IM podcast. We're going to focus on the IM side. <laughs> yeah. First thing from a financial, right? Can we afford this? Can't afford it. We, we don't have the funding, don't want to do something, you know, to solve this issue that's come up. Um, you know, maybe we don't need it. 
there's no per, you know, there's no realization of what is the benefit? Why do we need to do that? So therefore we're not going to do the funding or maybe, and this came up uh, earlier uh, this week with one of the clients I'm working with, um, you know, what's the return on the investment? Mm-hmm. A lot of people are looking for, okay, how does this save us money? You know, maybe, um, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Right. So there, there could be a few different financial things. Um, I think about it from a personal standpoint, there's, there's a fear that comes along sometimes with IEM, right? Job loss. This is going to automate me out of a position. Um, kingdoms crumble maybe internally, right? You maybe you've built a, a team or an organization that has a lot of headcount, and maybe there's some fear around losing some of that kingdom because yeah. um, you know you can lose familiarity with existing processes on the personal side. So you know how to do it today, and this is the way it works, right? I, I'm not going to switch to a smartphone because my flip phone is works just fine for me. Never mind all the benefits I'll get you know, out of moving to you know, the new technology. Um, this is what I like and this is, and I'm not willing to make a change. Um, you know, it could be things around red tape, other inefficiencies, and that probably strikes kind of what you were talking about on the privilege access management side, right? It's, uh, this is just another step I have to go through to get what I need, or you know, there's no, why am I doing this? Because it's just inefficient you know, perception of it. Um, and then I'm from the strategic side, I'm thinking, you know, it doesn't align with business needs. You know, why are we doing this? It doesn't make any sense strategically as an organization. Why do we need this? Or my favorite it is going to handle it, mm-hmm. toss it over the it wall, it, you figure it out. And all of a sudden I've got a whole bunch of, uh, heroes on the it side. I am heroics as I like to call it, who are making things happen despite, you know, the, the lack of investment, you know, whether it's financial or even just, you know, thought leadership on the business side to help with, um, you know, fixing problems maybe that don't work. What are you thinking? I, I think you raised a lot of the same points that probably are going to be in what I have to say. Uh, so I'll try not to repeat a lot of what you're saying because I agree with uh, where you're coming from. You know, the angle that I've chosen to look at resistance is that resistance to IAM is a lot like resistance to change as human beings. So we we kind of view the world as really human beings interacting and as human beings who are putting up the resistance. It's kind of like, you know how in our our practice, we have that slide, which is the top 10 reasons IAM projects fail. And if you trace those back, they're all the same reasons almost all projects fail, right? (laughs) It's not that it's not a creative slide or that it's not true. It's just, it's the same reasons things fail in other IT projects or other projects, right? HR projects or finance projects that are similar are the same reasons IAM projects fail for most for the most part. And I think the reason people resist change in IAM ties back a lot to why they resist change everywhere. And so I found this really cool blog, which I would like to link in the show notes. Um, but I'm going to go through a few of these and, and see which ones um, resonate, just kind of uh, let me know if you hear one that you want to um, kind of talk about. The first is misunderstanding about the need for change when the reason for change is unclear. So I think that's kind of what you were saying, where they're not people are not really sure of like what is the benefit here. Fear of the unknown. I think this is a big one, mm-hmm. especially for IAM and IT projects, which is like okay, you're bringing up something like privilege access management. I, what does that even What does that even really mean? I'm scared of that. I, I think, you know, in life, we can be scared of the unknown. And I think certainly when it comes to IAM projects, um, the same kind of thing is like people need to be educated about it. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing is it just education. So if, if you're not a trusted source of information, um, if you haven't kind of established that, yes, I actually know what I'm doing and that people um, believe that, then they may not even trust you as a source of of expertise in something. Um, so I, again, this is kind of going all the way back to like the human psycho- psychology aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, number three, lack of confidence. So this kind of goes back to when I was talking about the big gorillas where, you know, so one of the things I've run into with um, some of my clients is that they'll have a, a major IAM system that is has achieved a certain level of success. And now they've reached out to the big gorilla, like the big ERP system or the big EMR system in their organization. And they want to pull that in to the IM sphere. And they say, good, we can um, 
uh, integrate with your application for provisioning and we can, you know, suck out all the entitlements and it's going to be great. We're going to take mm-hmm. all this work off your shoulders. And they say, you know, you don't know how, how much work this, this really <laughs> is. Like right. you're not, you don't have the competence to take over what we do. It's, it's complex. You don't get the problem. And so just kind of getting into one of the ways I think to combat that is, uh, okay, so let's take the IGA, um, for example. So starting with IGA, I like to, like, let's walk before we can run. So let's start at a very low touch Mm -hmm. integration. Let's start collecting accounts and entitlements and showing that we can build the one place to go to know who has access to what. Let's get the account, let's correlate them to identities, and then we have a picture of what access a person has to the system. From as far as like any kind of risk that you could be putting toward that IGA system, it's minimal because all you're doing is kind of read, you have a kind of read only access. Right. And then you start stepping into more advanced features and you show that, look, we actually do have competence. We are able to, you know, integrate with your system without breaking things, without taking your system down. You're not now at the mercy of of our system being available in order to, or, or maybe you are at the mercy as you get into provisioning and access requests and things like that, and even more like single sign-on. Uh, but we've now had an opportunity to prove ourselves by stepping through this that, you know, we as we took on more and more risk, we took on more and more functionality, uh, we've shown success. So that's kind of the way I like to approach that kind of fear factor, that level of resistance, because it's like, okay, Jeff has come along. Now all of a sudden he wants to start provisioning our accounts. Well, mm-hmm. first off, I don't know that Jeff even has the capability. Second off, I don't know if his system is even going to be reliable. And the last thing I want to do is hand over some function that is critical for me to provide a service to the business. Um, and I don't know if Jeff can really do it. And right. so then Jeff comes and says, well, let, you know, I've got a responsibility to the business too, which is to show, you know, to have one place to go to know who has access to what, let me at least get a file feed or let me at least have a read only account to a database, uh, to a database view to pull the accounts and entitlements. And then we look at it and we say, all right, well, you know, if this is going to keep Jeff happy. Let's give him that. But it gives you an opportunity. First off, it does provide real value because now you see what people have access to in the big gorilla application, as well as all the other applications. But two, it's like, okay, look, that wasn't so bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're yeah. able to connect. It wasn't so bad. You got to build that trust, right? I mean, it's that, that, that competence factor. I see it going both ways. So the competence to be able to do what you're say you're going to do, right? Here's all the features. And I think that's part of, you know, good program management is managing the expectations, right? Because, you know, you don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. If anything, underpromise and overdeliver. That's kind of my motto. <laughs> so, you know, what, you know, build that trust with the organization that you can do what you're going to say do. But also from the resistance and the change standpoint, I see it on the other side too, where the way that you've been doing your work, right? If you're a recipient, of these kind of new things that are coming from IAM, you've got to be able to adapt and change the times, right? Maybe you've been working in a manual mode and creating SAP accounts, you know, for the last 10 years. And now there's a, you know, a better way to automate it and make it more efficient. Sometimes your skill sets are going to have to evolve with the organization. And I, I think sometimes, you know, people fear that on the other side of things too, is they're not willing to make that change, which is unfortunate. And sometimes that leads to you know, casualties in the, in the war <laughs> on the IM side. But if people are willing to change their skills or update their skills to keep up with times, you know, I think that that may um, you know, help sometimes with that. Just, it's an unfortunate and it's a sad thing. Sometimes people can, can't or won't change their own skill set to keep pace with where the organization is going. And that's just something to be aware of. So I think you just nailed the the skill of the ultimate podcast segue. Because number four was connected to the old way. You know, people who have emotional connections or are kind of hardwired to the way they've been doing things. Um, and now all of a sudden you're you're asking them to do things in a new way. Um, I also think, you know, I was thinking about a lot of automation over time has obsoleted manual ways of doing things. 
right? And some people don't, uh, people are afraid of being obsoleted, right? Especially right. Um, if they really like the job they have or are really connected to the job they have. They don't want to see that go away. They like maybe answering the phones and or getting the fax tickets and punching in, uh, you know, a user account. And there's fewer and fewer places that do that. But I guess what I'm getting as connected to the old way is another form of resistance. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Talk about the next one, which is low trust. Uh, people don't believe that they or the company can competently manage change. So this is another one where, you know, in that privilege access management um, competency that I talked about, a lot of times you're talking about a group of folks who are tasked with running your server environment um, or your network environment or Anything that's kind of that core infrastructure, anywhere that you'd want to roll out privilege access management. And those people are responsible for keeping systems online. And if those systems are down, they're you know penalized for not doing their job. And here you come along and you want to take over how they signed into this application. And now their success in being able to do their job is dependent on you and this technology that you're going to roll out. Now, making it, you know, sound very bad, but it, at some level it is. Like if your privilege access management system were to go down for an hour, and they had a server outage or they needed to get to servers and couldn't get passwords, potentially you could uh, be interfering with their ability to do their job. And so <clears throat> my kind of solution to this one is I really feel like those system teams can or in some cases should own privilege access management and that the IAM team should provide a support function or a um, you know at least a checks and balances to what that team does with the system. So you know this might not be the right solution for everybody, but if you're facing a lot of resistance where say the Windows server team or the, the Linux server team, you know, doesn't want to get on board with using privilege access management. They're constantly trying to look for workarounds so that they're not dependent on your system and your system is not as effective. One way that you could try to address that is put that team in charge of the PAM system. And it's like, guys, this is a utility for you. And what we look at us as part of the team who can help make it more effective. You know, from a from a security standpoint, I think most managers over a, a server support team, even a server support team of you know hundreds of administrators, is going to want to know that you know we when somebody leaves the organization, they're not a threat, and that we are doing some logging of what people are doing. Um, but at the same time, even though I want those things, I don't want to compromise my ability to deliver the services that I'm tasked with delivering. So um, if you put me in charge of the system, if I can be the person who makes sure that that system is working, I own it, uh, that is a potential solution to um, making me feel more secure and, and getting over this low trust hurdle that we talked about from a resistance standpoint. Yeah, their involvement, right? Making them part of the process. Yeah. Uh, we got to be open to making changes based on feedback from them too. I think that's one thing to think about from, a, from an IAM program perspective is to not be stuck on your path recognize when there are changes and suggestions that are good, right? And we'll make things easier and we'll help with adoption. Uh, don't be so regimented in your approach that this is the way we have to do it, right? It's okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. Let's figure out how to incorporate that. So if you involve the people, right, and take their feedback and actually incorporate it, that I think that helps drive that change as well. Yeah. Um, so the next one on here is temporary fad. And I wasn't sure how to associate <laughs> this one. but like the internet. Internet's a fad. You know what, Jeff? I mean, you, it, it's a good joke, right? The internet's a fad. Obviously, it doesn't make sense. Say the iPhone is a fad. The, I, the first iPhone came out 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was listening to Joe Rogan's podcast. I'm a, not that I'm I'm trying to advertise for another podcast, right? But you know, Joe There's Rogan podcast. He, he has a podcast, and huh. a lot of people tend to listen to it. Anyway, the iPhone's been out for 12 years. Think of how much it seems to have changed over the period. I mean, in some ways it's it's kind of the same thing, but in other ways it's so much more advanced. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think in the IAM space, there is like, we have to open our minds to the fact that, yeah, we're here every day and it doesn't seem like it's 
revolutionizing overnight, but we keep seeing these things pop up uh, where, you know, for example, um, uh, there's like the, the typing type of uh, multi-factor authentication. So it's looking at, I, so is that something cadence. that's, yeah. Keystroke cadence. Yeah, yeah. I don't even, couldn't even think of the name of it, but. Typing uh, DNA, it, I think was the product we looked at. Yeah, and the, and the product, I mean, look, the product looked great to me. And the only reason I'm bringing it up is like, is it a fad? Well, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you're right. going to try to, you know, get your users to accept something, you know, the good thing about that product is it really does need to be accepted by users because it's happening in the background. But, um, you know, is this something that's going to be around for a long time? I don't know. Or is it just a fad? Anyway, so that sure. was, I was going to skip that one because I don't think that's one of the main reasons for um, resistance. But yeah, when I think it comes to IAM, right, I think there are some things that are relatively mature, but there are components of IAM that are still being worked out. You mentioned like the biometrics, right, with the, the keystroke one. You know, I think there's still people searching for a reason to use blockchain, for example, right? Is that a fad? I don't know. It's pretty early. You know, I, you know, I think that's a conversation that we might tackle, you know, in a future episode in more detail. But um, I think there are components that are pretty solid fundamental, right? Automation. But I think there are some things where we're not sure yet if it, if it is a fad or not. It takes some time to bake. That's true. That's true. And, you know, if something's around for five years, it's not considered a fad, I think, in this space. But if you think about the, the course of human history <laughs> or, the you know, the, the course of computers, even that's, it's a blip. Right. Well, bell bottoms were popular in the seventies. Right. And then they're like, Oh, who would wear those in the eighties and nineties? And then they started to come back again. So right. it's cyclical. <laughs> so the next one on the list in this really good blog is not being consulted. And I think this is something we see all the time where, you know, people feel like, Hey, if I wasn't brought in to help define the, the problem and to find the solution, then um, I'm not going to agree with it. Mm -hmm. That's not always the case, but I do see that pop up a lot. In fact, I'd say within our advisory services area, one of the things that we do is say, you know, get lots of people involved. If you're not sure, involve them, at least get their view of what is the problem. Um, then they're more likely to be on board with the solution. Because I, I think that it's easy to go out when you're doing an advisory sales pitch, for example, people want to know, what is it that you guys do? And then we say, well, we, we put together a strategy that's going to achieve buy-in. And the question is like, well, how are you going to do that? I, I think to get buy-in um, to the solution, people have to feel like they were part of the definition of the problem. So you guys are the industry. In other words, so if I'm in the seat of one of these people, you guys are the industry experts. But let me tell you about how things are here mm -hmm. and what my problem is and what I want to see. Uh, improved. And then if you can come back later and say, you said A, B, C, D, E, F, and here's how we're going to solve each one of those problems. Okay. If I truly believe you're the experts or, and you're, and what you're saying seems logical and you've and well thought through and you give me an opportunity to ask questions, I'll buy in mm -hmm. because I was part of the per, a part of the, the definition of the problem. Yeah. It, that involvement, right. Helps. So if they're part of that part of that discussion, I think sometimes you know you just want people's voices to be heard, right? And that, and maybe that's what they're looking for too. Did you take it? Did you take us into account, or did you forget about us? And I think if you can demonstrate that, yeah, you know what, you were part of the part of the process. You know, we heard you, and here's how we're going to solve your specific problems. I think that's a powerful message that comes out of the program itself, right? Making sure that you know, from a program management standpoint, you are listening to your constituents, right? You're out there shaking hands, um, you know, kissing babies, all the stuff that you need to do on the polit uh, politics side of IAM program management, making sure that people's voices are heard and that um, you're recognizing that. Absolutely. So the next one is poor communication. It probably is, it is it's self-evident, <laughs> isn't it? When it comes to change management, there's yeah. no such thing as too much communication. I mean, what have, what are some of your experiences with, with this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, a lot of it, and I'll go back to, you know, help desk days where, what do you mean there's this new process, right? People aren't aware of it or, oh, this is how we're doing this now. Um, I wasn't aware that this is, 
you know, the way that we reset our new passwords or, you know, things like that. How do I request access? A lot of the stuff, you know, it's the communication needs to be pretty open and, and clear, but you have to make sure that your communications are tailored for your audience, right? You're going to, you're going to talk a different way to your C-suite, your executives on how things are supposed to work versus somebody who may be working on a line, right? So if you're bottling, you know, Windex, uh, and you need access to a, a terminal machine that's on that line, there's going to be a different communication style and approach because people have different levels of understanding between what are the services you're providing, you know, how do they take advantage of those services, et cetera. So I think you need to make sure that when you're communicating, you're thinking about all of these different things, um, and it stretches across the organization. Um, I always used to hate it when people would throw things into production and it was, okay, you know, ID admin, you guys figure out how you're going to support it. Well, <laughs> how can we include us as part of that process so we could help make sure that the process you're thinking about actually do make sense in the real world? Um, so you want to make sure that you've got your ops team, you know, part of that part of that communication path as well. But make sure your end users know about the services, right? I mean, that that's going to help with the adoption as well. Um, you know, yeah, just, just make sure people know about it. I don't think anyone would ever complain about too much communication. Um, especially in an organization where uh, sometimes that there is not enough communication historically, maybe not for your own project, but maybe for other things. I think people just want to be informed. Great. And this, um, I think poor communication um, is really highlighted when you're talking about um, change resistance that's happening in the end user population. So you're rolling out some kind of change, a new single sign-on system that's going to affect hundreds or thousands of people or you know, I guess there are cases where you could be affecting millions of people mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they end up on the screen. They don't know what to do and they don't feel like they knew this was coming. Right. That's a bad experience. One of the things that this whole discussion reminded me of, though, is that, you know, from a project management standpoint, if you're managing an IAM project, one, you should have an organizational change management plan. In other words, how are the changes that you're implementing going to affect your end user, not, not just your end users, but every party that gets affected. And really try to think of that from a 360 degree perspective. The second thing is usually in a, in a more advanced SDLC, the um, communication plan is going to be separate from the org change plan. So have a separate communication plan. It just shows you how important communication is and that, you know, the idea that you, you can't over communicate. There's no such thing. Right. And this isn't something that's easy, right? Sometimes you may not even know who you need to communicate to. And you're going to have to, you know, talk with different folks and make sure that you try and get as much feedback as possible. But um, it's it, it's not an easy thing, but it's a necessary thing to have a successful program. Right. You know, I think there are a couple other, other uh, good points in here, but I'm going to go through them because we're getting a little long here. Um, changes to routines. So that's impact of people getting used to doing things a certain way. And then all of a sudden you're changing the way they have to do it. If they don't see that change as beneficial to them or, you know, saving them time or they like it better for whatever reason, that can be, um, you know, you can face resistance, uh, exhaustion, saturation. So this is something big that we've run into, I think, with a lot of our clients is that there's so much change going on in the IT environment and information workers are getting like deluged with new systems, upgrades and things. And, you know, they wind up spending a big part of their day just dealing with, um, you know, dealing with IT change. Mm -hmm. And then here you come along with one more thing and they're going to be resistant to that because it's like, stop, let's slow down. I've got a job to do. So I think that's where that uh, part of change management can, uh, or resistance to change can come up with IAM. Uh, change in the status quo so resistance can also stem from perceptions of the change that people hold. For example, people who feel that they'll be worse off at the end of the change are unlikely to give their full support. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a, a, going back to that Pam example, like, you know, if you don't see a problem with the way things are working today, if you're a system administrator and you log into a thousand servers using the same username and password, it's not a problem for you. Yeah. How am I going to benefit from you locking my account in a vault and I don't know the password for it? How does that help me? Right. Okay. It helps you because it makes the organization more secure and we're less likely to get hacked and, you know, for it to be your fault. But 
you know, we're less like, so it's to look for those reasons why, you know, changing the status quo actually provides you benefit. And the last one is benefits or rewards, which is that uh, when people don't understand what is the benefit, whether it's kind of an intrinsic benefit or not, um, you know, do how, how are they benefiting or how's the organization benefiting um, when you're, you know, this, as far as I see, the process is not better for me. So what is the benefit? Why do I need, it? Why do I need this? What am I, what is the, yeah, what is, why is this good for me? I think that's really what it comes down to, right? You're changing things up. So why do I need to do this? I think as IT leaders, we have to be open to the idea that we're going to market our, our changes and our, you know, if we're going to push change on the organization, we have to be open to the idea that we're going to market and convince people that it's actually a good idea. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think we should be resistant to that that thought. I think we should be willing to, um, you know, take the time to really make sure that we understand the benefits and that we are, you know, bouncing up against the wall with people who can question them. And then we go out to the broader audience and and market that, hey, this is going to provide a benefit to you or to the organization or to our customers, and therefore it's worth you putting up with the, you know, what you see as the downside of the change. Right. Yeah. And if you've got data around that, I think that helps too. Sometimes that you may not have something like, oh, this is going to save, you know, this much time or this much cost, you know, on the way we do business. Sometimes you, you can't calculate the benefits and it's things like, oh yeah, we just know it's a better, easier, more secure process, right? Sometimes that's hard to calculate. And sometimes it goes back to the rate, uh, to the return on the investment, you know, side of it. But um, Understanding that and selling it. I'm a big fan of treating I am like a product, even if it's a product that is internal, right? Your customers are going to be your coworkers, contractors, vendors, whoever is sitting inside the firewall, so to speak. You know, not traditionally true customers who might be, you know, more of a B2C use case, right? Where you're dealing with folks that are not working for your company. But if you can take the mindset of this is this is my I am product. I think that goes a long way to helping with a lot of these different areas, you know, communicating it, understanding um, the benefits for it, for it and being able to market it and sell it to people. And, you know, sometimes you need to take a a grassroots approach too. sometimes taking a top down executive approach may not be as effective. Maybe you want to get some admins involved and say, hey, I know you're typically putting in a bunch of forms for, you know, ads and removes every week. What if I had a better way for you to do that? Right. And you start working with folks on the ground level and help them understand the value and you kind of tackle it from both sides. I think sometimes that helps helps get that benefit um, statement out there so people understand why this is helpful for them. I also like bribery. Bribery is a good one. (laughs) Yeah. If you can, well, you, I mean, you say that jokingly, but you've had some, I thought, some killer ideas or some killer experiences in terms of running contests and giving away, you know, AirPods or whatever. Mm -hmm. having contests. Go ahead, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, so I think the one that that probably stands out the most for me would be, you know, we we launched a self-service password reset capability and the enrollment in the system was not where we wanted it to be. It was pretty low. It was only like 30 or 40%, I think. So what we did was, okay, well, how do we solve that? And I thought was, okay, well, iPad was new (laughs) at the time, right? New technology. It cost a few hundred bucks. It was like four or 500 bucks at the time. What if we gave away an iPad and to be eligible for that giveaway as part of a raffle, all you had to do was have your, you know, voice print or your secret questions and answers. This is a long time ago, um, enrolled in the system. And if you were enrolled, by the end of the summer, you know, we'd have a raffle and give away an iPad or two or three, whatever. It was. Um, we saw a huge <laughs> uptick, you know, time. It was it was something that was of value enough that people were interested in, right? It wasn't like, oh, you get a free T-shirt. Okay, some people that might be motivated, but most people weren't. So, you know, for that four or five hundred dollar investment on an iPad, we went from like forty percent enrollment at the beginning of the summer to like over eighty or close to ninety percent. Forget the exact number. Um, by the end of that summer. And it was in conjunction with other things too, right? Working with um, folks who are taking the calls to say, hey, did you know that you could have done this, you know, your password reset, your your own this time? Can I help you walk through, you know, how to set that up? So if you're 
your first line support is aware of your processes and capabilities, you know, they can also help market those you know, to the end users as well. But uh, I think bribery is a great one. <laughs> I'm a fan of it. And sometimes it's super cost effective. If, you, if uh, it's something that's tolerated within the organization doing giveaways like that, um, you know, you know, do lunch and learns and brown bags and uh, drives. Again, treat it, if you treat it like a, pro- a product, right, make it interesting for people and help them understand how easy it is to use your services because hopefully you're developing services that are easy to use and, you know, unobstructive as much as possible. That'll help, um, you know, with the adoption of it. Yeah. Oh, I think those are great ideas and great experiences. Um, you know, Jeff, but we keep doing this podcast. Nobody's going to need to hire us because <laughs> we're going to give away all of our good ideas. That's fine. We're all in it together. I think, you know, one of the common things that I've heard and, and read about in some of the feedback emails that we've gotten is that, hey, I'm not alone, right? It's everyone struggles with this. If I am was easy, everyone would be doing it. And I think the stronger that we all collectively get on the I am side, there's enough change, right? I'm willing to adapt my skills and understand new technologies. You know, that's part of our job, right? Is understanding what's next. Um, but, you know, I think it just drives security. And, um, you know, it's something that I certainly enjoy having these conversations around because I'm always curious, what is next, right? I've probably asked it before. What's the next interface look like? Is it voice? Is it, you know, some sort of machine learning that knows what I want before I want it? Is it some, you know, tied to some sort of biometric? I don't know, right? There's probably options around all of those. Is the technology there yet to support it? Eh, probably not, at least not on a scale and a cost level that makes sense. But, um, you know, there's always something that can be changed. And, you know, that feedback of you're not alone <laughs> is certainly one that resonates too out there. Well, I lo- yeah, I love the fan mail that we've been getting, uh, you know, every time. I, I call it fan mail. or That mail. sounds so weird to say. Don't say that, I, fan mail. I know, I can't. <laughs> having fans so um but no the the mailbag idea and getting feedback certainly appreciated so if you're out there drop us a line even just to let us know you're listening but um also anything that you'd like us to discuss in future episodes or any observations you've made to anything we've talked about that you'd like us to share um we'd love to hear from you and uh it, it really helps to keep us going to know that people actually value what we're doing yeah it's not just the two of us just sitting here talking to each other in our in our dark basements or rooms or wherever we have to be yeah. right we would do it probably anyway, anyway. <laughs> exactly exactly so jeff you and i are going to be on the road for the next few weeks yeah. however we're planning on recording anyway yes we are we're going we're doing it for the people it's for the love of the game. <laughs> uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how we do it, but our next couple, yeah, we're on the road, I think four straight weeks. So that'll be interesting. Um, but uh, at least we'll be in the same room and you know, we'll, we'll have to see how it goes. But yeah, the plan is to definitely put content out there uh, every week still, like we've been doing for 12 weeks in a row, which I think a milestone for us. It is a milestone. Quarter, That's, right? Well, 13 weeks is a quarter. So I think our next one is going to be really, truly, which, this, so is this episode 12 or did we release episode 12 today? Episode 11 we're, went live we're, today and we're, yeah, we're typically a week ahead. We're, so now we're pulling back uh, the curtain a little bit, breaking down that fourth wall. We're typically recording a week in advance, uh, which is, you know, smart as if I do say so, because, you know, we are on the road. Sometimes it's difficult to get, um, you know, time to be able to put out a, a decent recording and something that we think might be interesting, but this would be a good challenge for us next couple of weeks, right? Yeah, well, so so putting that out there, I'd like to hear feedback from, you know, our listeners, especially those of us who are IM practitioners to say, okay, what is the type of of content you think you'd get the most value out of? Is it a conversation like we had today where we pick on something like resistance to change and kind of give it the IM slant? Uh, Is it hearing product, you know, talking to folks who are kind of in the field with product companies or, you know, doing implementations who um, can talk about their specific spot in the world and maybe their company. Is it a combination of those two things? Do you just like hearing Jim and Jeff ramble? (laughs) Whatever kind of feedback you can provide like that, I think we'd love to hear it. Yeah, definitely. And you can send it to questions at identity at the center.com. Definitely read all the emails that come through and um, look forward to hearing that feedback. So I think that's a pretty good spot to leave it for this week. Um, I will put a link to the blog that Jim referred to in the show notes. And before I forget, you were talking about the 10 pitfalls um, 
thing earlier on one of our slides. We actually have an ebook around that that <laughs> that we did last year. So I'll put a link to that as well in the show notes. And uh, I think that's pretty good. We'll call it for this week. Thanks, Jim. And thank you all for listening. You've been listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. To access all episodes, visit identityatthecenter.com.